Okay, so we're going to get started uh, today. I, obviously, I'm doing slightly better than last class, so I'm going to do my best. Hopefully, my voice will hold out um, through today. But I don't like playing the recordings if I can avoid it, so we're going we're gonna to give it a go. Um, congratulations, by the way. You just made it through the first quarter of the class. You're 25% of the way through. That's kind of scary and satisfying all at the same time. So um, that's a good thing. So we're down eight classes. We're on 109 today. And that means it's time to switch out of Photoshop and into InDesign. So I know things go fast. One of the important things to distinguish, though, when we switch out of Photoshop is it doesn't mean that you can forget everything that you learned in Photoshop. It doesn't mean you can just say, oh, I'm never going to touch Photoshop again. It actually means that I assume that every time you use an image, you're going to retouch it in Photoshop before it goes into InDesign. So Photoshop is still very much part of this workflow that you're developing. But now we're going to start to talk about graphic design, layout, boards, those kinds of things. And today is kind of an overview of graphic design. And I'll, I'll start at the, the big picture stuff. And then we'll get into some of the technical details coming forward in the next couple weeks. Uh, we will also introduce InDesign as a program today. Um, some of you are in 121 or have already taken 121, in which case you've done a bunch of InDesign work already. Hopefully I can still have a few tricks that will help you out uh, that will let you do a little bit better job on your 121 stuff going forward. Um, so like I said, today is kind of the broad overview. But let's start with a question. What is the function of graphic design and why is it important? Anybody have any ideas? I know it's like 8 in the morning and nobody wants to talk. Thoughts? Yeah, Brooke. Sure, I think that's great. So in that sense, it's about selling a product. That product or that sales of a product doesn't necessarily have to apply to, you know, I'm selling this ruler or I'm selling this, you know, whatever Yeti mug or whatever. It could be selling something like a lecture series, something that you want to go to. It could be anything that you're trying to draw somebody's attention in. That's where this graphic design comes in. And it's important because if we didn't do graphic design, things would look really ugly. And those of us that care about the world around us and the design, not in terms of like sustainability and that kind of <laughs> stuff, I'm saying in terms of the things we look at and the fact that we're stuck in a really ugly building with these god-awful orange things sticking down out of the ceiling that bug me every time I walk in here, those of us that care about aesthetics, this matters. It matters a lot. And you can see it. You can see on certain products the care that's gone into this design process. So the function of graphic design. Fundamentally, it's about the communication of messages through the juxtaposition of words and pictures. So we're trying to communicate something using graphics, i.e. words and pictures. It's, it's in a way the visual synthesis of thought. You think something, you have to figure out how to explain it to somebody. This is how you would explain it. Design objectives. We could come up with a bunch more of these. These are just a, a handful of, of places to get started. But guidance, persuasion, encouragement, communication, all of which big fundamental things that you're trying to get across with graphic design. Motivation, maybe you want to motivate somebody to go to that lecture series. Education, dialogue, inspiration, promotion, information, you get this idea. I could go on and on. And I always throw in lots of images. Establishing function. What is the purpose of your design? Is it an invitation? Is it a poster? Is it a book? Is it, I don't know, packaging? You can come to a lot of, a lot of uh, different uses here. What is the primary objective? So on any one of these things, there's always a primary objective. So let's say for a second that we're doing an invitation. What's the objective of the invitation? get somebody to come to something, right? So you want to inspire somebody into coming. So there's an objective to that invitation. What's the objective of a book? Well, it could have two. The cover of a book, the objective would be get somebody to read the book. The objective of the book itself may be share information. 
Maybe do something else. Persuade somebody to do something. What about a poster? Well, a poster is typically about something. Maybe it's an inspirational thing. Maybe it's a lecture series poster. You want somebody to come to the lecture series in the first place. So there's always a purpose and there's always an objective. And then who is the audience? Who do you want looking at this? If it's a lecture series poster, and I keep coming back to the lecture series poster because that's what you're going to do for your next assignment. Um, so if it's a lecture series poster, who's the audience? It's all of your fellow students. So it has an intent. It has somebody that it's trying to reach. And then the desi desired reaction, obviously, come to the lecture series. It's the designer's responsibility to create strong communicative experiences that support the function of design on behalf of the client and for the viewer. So this sentence has a lot to it. So let's take a quick look at it in more detail. My pencil is dead. That's annoying. Okay, so we've got support the function of design on behalf of the client. So the client is the person who's paying for it, the person who asked you to do it in the first place. So in the world of school, nobody actually pays you to do anything. You actually pay to do it, which is weird. But I, in this case, would be the client because I'm the one asking you to do it. So it's on behalf of me because I'm the one asking you to do it, but it's not for me because I'm having you do it for the person it's intended to inspire or the person it's intended to have come to the lecture. So you're doing it on behalf of me for all of the students who need to go to the lecture series. Does that make sense? So it doesn't mean that the client and the viewer are necessarily the same person. And that's a key distinction. So the viewer can be somebody entirely separate from the client. So these are different people. Designer skills. Analysis, perception, communication, research, management, problem solving, visualization. You get the idea. There's a lot of things involved here, all of which are quite important. I'm going to start with a couple big things today. One is inspiration, and the other is intuition. They're both I words, but I think they're both really important. So I had just the blank slide up here that said inspiration, and then I was going to go into it. And I said, well, wait a minute. Maybe I should actually talk about the definition of inspiration in the first place. So I threw, this is just the Google definition. But essentially, inspiration, the process of being mentally stimulated to do or feel something, especially to do something creative. So you're stimulated to do something creative. OK, that sounds reasonable. A sudden, brilliant, creative, or timely idea. That sounds pretty good, too. I wish I had more of those. The other thing that I think is interesting here is down here in the origin section at the bottom, in Middle English, in the sense, divine guidance. Now, I'm not, this is not a religious class. We're not going to talk about all that kind of stuff. But I think it's interesting that it's all interwoven with this idea of inspiration. So how do you become inspired? Well, the first thing you need to do is be aware of your surroundings. So attentiveness, observation, and open-mindedness are all three really critical things. And I think for you guys as students, it's really easy to get in the mindset of, oh man, I've got this 8 a.m. class, 7.55 technically. I've got this 7.55 a.m. class. Huh, I woke up at 7.45. I've got to get there. Ha, ha, ha. OK. I'm here. Go ahead. Tell me what to. Huh. Right? That's how you guys are when you come in. I, I see you every time. Right? You stumble in like that. Were you aware of all the things that were happening when you were on your way here? No. You weren't being inspired by anything? Probably not. But you can be. You set your alarm a little bit earlier. You wake up and you, you have a cup of coffee if you drink coffee or tea or whatever. And you become a little bit more aware of your surroundings and suddenly you could be inspired. And it can be something entirely simple. I could be walking up to get my copies from the copy center and I could see that the sun's rising and it's hitting the concrete at a certain angle and it's really accentuating texture. And I could say, wow, and this is obviously in an architectural sense, wow, that would be a really neat feature if I could do some artificial lighting that would backwash a wall and I would get that, that texture. That's inspiration. And it's happening because I'm aware of what's going on around me. Same thing happens when you open a package and you see somebody took extra care in the font choice that was used on the packaging 
or how it was wrapped, what the box looked like. If you're aware of that stuff, as opposed to just opening up the Amazon box and oh, let me have my stuff, if you're aware of that, if you take a little more time, you may be inspired by certain elements. The way that the box fits together, the way they slide, the sound it makes when they come apart. I don't know. That's about being aware and observing your surroundings. The best designers are completely aware of everything that's going on around them all the time. Because there's so much to absorb. It's found and then transformed into tangible objects. You as a designer are never going to do something entirely unique. And you're like, wait a minute, how could he possibly say that? Why am I in design school in the first place? I want to do something brand new that nobody's ever done before. Guess what? It's all been done before. All of it. I remember, I remember that the, the, the moment that this, this light bulb went off in my head, and actually it took a while, I think it was a senior um, in, in, uh, at Berkeley doing my architecture degree, and I had spent, I don't know, three or four weeks designing this project, and I was all into it, and it was great, I was excited about it, and I did my final presentation, and I got through it, and some of the reviewers, they were like, yeah, this is great, this is great, this is great, and then this next reviewer came up, and he said, yeah, have you seen the, I don't even remember what it was, I'm like, no, I haven't seen that, said, yeah, why don't you go, like, look it up. Okay, sounds good. Looked it up, it was exactly my project. Hadn't seen it before, somebody had already done it. That happens, it's part of design. What we do is we take all of the little tiny ideas that are floating around in our head, and we chop them up, and we mix them up, and we create something new based on old stuff. And that's normal, that's the way design works. So it's not a bad thing to recycle, reuse, change, transform, modify, that's part of this process. And so when I say something's new, not new, that's true. It's not new. There's always elements that have been used before. We're just adapting and modifying and making a little bit different. And that's making them unique. The other thing about inspiration is it's different for absolutely everybody. Right? If Sydney and I went to the same lecture and we saw somebody speak, you would come away with something entirely different than what I came with you would be interested in something that I was not interested in, and I would be interested in something that you were not interested in. I mean, maybe we would be interested in the same thing. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is that it's always different for different people. You all have a different experience. You're bringing different stuff to the table to work with, and when you do that, you're interested in different things. And that's okay. That's part of being a designer. If we were all the same, everything would look the same, and that wouldn't be any fun. So be aware that it's always different you go to the, a lecture series with your friend, you go experience something different with your friend. Somebody's interested in one thing, somebody's interested in another. It should not be a chore or require a lot of extra effort for you to nurture this inspiration. This should just be part of you. You're all in this field for a reason. You like it to begin with. It comes from a desire to create or to communicate. Again, you're all here because you have that desire. That's the fun thing about teaching all of you. Could I teach like high school? No way. Could I teach like middle school? Definitely not. Could I teach elementary school? God help me. But I am here and I love teaching all of you because you're already at a place where you know what you're interested in. And because you're interested in this, let's cultivate that. Don't forget to look inward and tap your own creative inspirations. If you like to paint, paint. If you like to draw, draw. If you like to do something else that's creative, you like to play the piano, I don't know. Do that. That helps. Collect. So there's so many things around us that are inspirational, once you're aware and open to them, uh, receiving them, that you need to find a way to collect those ideas. Because no matter how good your brain is at cataloging and keeping track of all those various things that you've seen every day, you forget stuff. So if you can collect it and put it in a place where you can go back and look through it, that's a good thing. That could be a sketchbook. It could be in your phone. You could be just taking pictures of things. You see something really cool, you take a picture of it. That's a new kind of technology. It's really nice that you guys all can do that. I didn't get to used to, I didn't used to be able to do that. So it's a good thing. Write notes, make drawings, take photographs for all non-physical inspirations, but also collect things. 
Like you draw on a napkin, you stick it in your notebook. You, you find something that's really cool graphically, you collect it, you stick it in there. The more you cultivate and you capture all that stuff, the better it will be down the road because you'll have this book of ideas. So you carry your sketchbook with you all the time. I used to always have one on me. And then I got old and stopped carrying one. Do I always have my phone on me? Yeah. Can I always take a picture of something? Yeah. Do I? If you looked at my camera roll, you'd be shocked at all the weird stuff that I take pictures of. It's like, oh, that's really cool. Take a picture of it. I don't know. My wife looks at it like, why do you have pictures of that? I like concrete. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Become immersed in design. So that's the other thing that's really fun about being in school, is that you guys are here, you're learning about design, you're with a bunch of other people who are interested in design, there's lecture series that are going on, there's different classes, you're talking to your professors, there's me talking to you, and then Daniel's talking to you, and then um, Jeffrey's talking to you, and you're getting all this different information, different perspectives, that's fun, because you're immersing yourself in this whole design thing. If you go to work for a firm, you want to do the same thing. You want a collaborative firm. You want something where everybody talks to each other. If you go to work and you don't ever talk to anybody, it's not as fun. Design is a collaborative thing. Communicate with other designers. That's a good one. You're all designers. Talk to each other about design. Ask each other questions about it. That's a good thing. Talk to other people. If you feel stuck, maybe take a walk. Maybe listen to some music. You'd be surprised how well music does at unlocking this inspiration. Okay, so I have a confession. It's kind of entertaining. So the way grad school works when you get a master's degree in architecture is you do this big project, your thesis project, and it culminates with a big presentation. You have a 45-minute presentation. You do this big exhibition. You have, uh, I think it's 24 feet of wall space for your drawings, and it's, like, it's a big deal. And you spend all this time and effort working on that, and you give this big presentation, and they have reviewers. And then you get to write an 80 to 300 page paper on that project. And you get to do that in three weeks after your project's over. Weird, right? So you have to figure out, and a lot of people, it's actually surprising how many people don't officially graduate at the end of their master's because it takes them longer than three weeks. They have to go on deferment so that they can finish their paper. So you have to figure out in those three weeks how to write this giant paper of all the stuff you've uncovered and discovered. So for me, I would come in, I'd get up really early. I've always been a morning person. Even, even It's like I'm not an architecture type person because for some reason I'm a morning person, not a night person. And all the, all the normal designers are night people, whatever. Anyway, so everybody would be leaving studio and I'd be showing up. I'd get up at like four and come in because that's how my brain works. And I'd sit down and I'd put on headphones and I'd start writing. And this was back in the day where you didn't have earbuds. It was like the big old headphones, right? So I'd sit down, I'd put my hood up, put my headphones in, and I wrote my thesis. And I wrote my 90-page thesis to a certain piece of music. Do you want to know what that piece of music was? Do you really want to know? Yeah, it was the Pirates of the Caribbean soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. But for whatever reason, I could put that on and I could just write. And I don't know why. It didn't have anything to do with what I was writing about, but for some reason, that worked. And so you need to think about, as ridiculous and as embarrassing as it might be to admit that the Pirates of the Caribbean was your theme song for writing the, the thesis, if you can find that piece of music that helps you, why wouldn't you listen to it? That's a big deal. So think about that, because it can really make a difference. I actually had a few different pieces of music, and I'll share some a little bit later on, that helped me do certain things. And so if you can find that, by all means, do it. Explore other areas of interest. Attend conferences, lectures, events. Explore. Try something new. Inspiration is the first step toward the final design. It always is. I just think that's fun. Anybody read this? It's a great book. Whatever. For whatever it's worth. I like the cover. That's why it's there. The design process. So we're going to go into this, every one of these steps in detail going forward. Research, information gathering, brainstorming, conceptualization, experimentation, development, and finally, execution. So let's look at all these one by one. So the design process. The thing about the design process is you can't skip steps. It doesn't work that way. So if you jump ahead, if you try to just 
I got this. I know what my project is. I'm going to do the final draft and be done. It's never going to work. Because you don't have all that iterative stuff that happens along the way. And you'll get to the end and you'll have to go back and start over. It's just the way it works. You can't focus on the final product. Design is fundamentally an evolutionary process. You do something, you evolve, you do something, you change it, you come back, you change it. Anybody ever gotten to the end of a project and felt like, if I could just do it over again, I would do this? That's normal. That's the way it should be. I spent a whole semester in grad school designing a cube. It was a building that was a square. It was a cube. I got to the very end of the semester, and the, the professor, we were having our after semester meeting, she said, are you ready to move on from this cube? I said, yeah, I'm ready. She said, it took you a while. I said, I know but I'm ready to move on. The point is that you, there's always something more. There's always some place more to go. Every step must have your full attention. That's the way design works. Yes, it can be totally exhausting, but it can also be the most rewarding thing that you ever do because it's such a cool way of creating things. So the project brief, the program, this is the initiation of the design process. This is where we get started. It should be a meticulous overview of the project. Notice I said it should be a meticulous overview. So when somebody gives you the project, especially when it's in school, generally it's fairly meticulous. There's a lot of requirements, though I love to like, leave loose ho holes and things. So when you get to 136, you'll know that there's lots of loose things that you can weave your way around. It should be meticulous. But inevitably, when you're working in the design field, you get somebody who says, I want to hire you to do X. And so I'm going to speak in architecture terms for right now, because I think it helps. Uh, for me, it's an easier way of explaining it. But in the, in the world of architecture, let's say that somebody decided, I want to do a kitchen. And they came to me and said, I want to hire you to design my kitchen for me. Great. <coughs> Sounds good. That's all the information they gave me. So I run off and I say, OK, that's great. I'm going to do this giant kitchen. It's a chef's kitchen. It's got double stoves, double ovens. Oh, let's throw in two refrigerators. Like, this is great. And I present this whole design to them. I'm like, well, wait, wait, we travel all the time. We don't, we, don't, we don't ever cook. We want like a microwave and a refrigerator, a mini refrigerator. Like, well, wait a minute. You didn't tell me. Well, guess what? That's where this comes in, this project brief. If somebody comes to you and says, I want you to design my kitchen for me, you say, oh, that's great. Let's talk about what you really want. That's where this program comes into play. It addresses the design in detail so we know the scope of what we're trying to do and every aspect of the problem. In the world of graphic design, it should define, remember we talked earlier about this, the roles of the designer, you, the client who you're designing for, and the viewer, the person you're designing for, or I guess the person who hired you and the person you're designing for. So you need to know who all those three people are at this stage of the game. Then we move forward. We begin with information given by the client. Like I said, you could have somebody say, I want you to design a kitchen, and that's all the information they give you. It's your job as the designer to clarify and simplify the information for use, and then ask questions. It's a big one. Because if you don't ask the questions, if you don't say, well, wait a minute, what size kitchen do you want? You waste all your time. So think about what kinds of missing pieces there are and how do you fill in those pieces. Have a conversation. Define the primary goals and messages to be expressed. What are you trying to sell? Define restrictions. This is often monetary budget restrictions when I say restrictions. But there could be other things. It could be like, I can only do a poster in black and white. Or I, you know, I only want <coughs> one color on the poster. It could be some arbitrary restriction. I don't know. Um, it could be the size format. It can't be larger than uh, 8 by 10 or whatever. There could be restrictions. Make sure you define those. And then define a timetable for completion. How long do you have to work on this? Good news about this, when you get a handout from me, when you get your next uh, assignment handout for uh, assignment 103, all this is going to be on there. It's going to tell you what it needs to have on it. It's going to tell you who these people are. It's going to tell you when it's due. And it's going to define any restrictions that you have, i.e., it has to be 11 by 17. And then ultimately define the audience, who you're trying to reach with this particular piece of design. 
Then we get into gathering. This is collecting all the textual and visual information that's going to be included on the poster or on whatever graphic design piece it is. So you're bringing together all that stuff so that you're ready to start the design process. You're going out and you're gathering that information. And that's an important piece of the puzzle. If anything's missing, you should request it from the client or figure out how to get it and or define who is going to create it. And that's a big one because sometimes somebody would hire you to create something under the assumption that you're going to write the paragraphs about it or the descriptions about the product or whatever it is that you're designing in the first place. When in fact you, the graphic designer, are just about the layout and where it shows up on the page. Somebody else is responsible generally for writing that information. And so you need to find out who that somebody else is or do they really want you to do it, in which case maybe you can charge a little more, for example. Research. Gain an understanding of the topic. It's really hard to be a good designer and not have a general understanding of what it is you're designing. And this is also one of the really fun things about doing design work in general, is you're hired to do a variety of different things. Even in school, you're asked to design a variety of different things. And it doesn't matter whether you're an industrial design student or whether you're um, an architecture student, the same kinds of things happen where you're asked to design something. In architecture, you're often asked to design a museum or a library. And then you might get somebody else where you're designing a house. Uh, the 220 people are designing a school. The 221 people are designing a skyscraper. So there's lots of different things that you're asked to design. In industrial design, you might, uh, what, last semester it was a, uh, some kind of a car interface. Uh, the semester before, it was a little speaker setup. It varies. And so you, the designer, need to gain an understanding of what that is. That means you have to see what else is out there. It would be really hard to design a zoo if you didn't understand what was involved in a zoo, if you'd never been to a zoo before. In grad school, uh, one of the projects that I had to do was a bathhouse. I'd never been to a bathhouse. I don't know what goes in a bathhouse. So how was I supposed to design a bathhouse when I didn't know anything about it? So in order to do that design project, I had to do research. You will have to do research as well. And that's the fun thing, because you're always doing research on different things. You have to become an expert in these other things so that you can design for that. Read, evaluate, and understand all the provided materials. If somebody's asking you to do a cover for a book, design the cover for a book, It'd be pretty hard to design the cover for a book if you didn't read the book, right? So you probably have to read the book. Independently research additional information. So don't, ju don't just rely on the client to hand you all the information. Go out and do your own research. Review the client's commun current communication materials. So for example, at DVC, if I was going to do something, let's say somebody wanted a letter of recommendation, I need to know what the letterhead looks like for DVC, what fonts they like you to use, that sort of thing. I have to present a unified front. That's available information. I need to go research that. Investigate competitive markets. So if you're designing a zoo, what other zoos are out there? What are the really good zoos that are out there? What have they done that makes this good? You're designing a library. What makes a library good? You're designing a speaker. What makes this, this speaker good? Why do people buy certain speakers over other speakers? investigate those competitive markets. That's all in the research phase. Now we get into the real design work. So that was all background information. We get into this free writing, mind maps, thoughts and ideas, visual inspiration boards, I sh collecting inspiration, putting them in one place. And then I highlight this one thing at the bottom, sketch. All too often, you guys aren't sketching enough. You should be sketching all the time. Because that's how you get your ideas out. That's how you can think through your ideas and get them onto some form that you can reuse over and over again. So get them out of your head and onto some piece of paper. Hopefully it's in a sketchbook. That would be ideal. Then we move into conceptualization. This is where you're formulating that plan for the project. This is the thematic link between your design and the function and ultimately the delivery. This is where you're actually synthesizing all those thoughts and sketches and everything into something that's a real product. And you're moving that product forward. Then you get into that experimentation and design development phase. This is fun. 
This is where you're looking at something, you're trying something new, you're evolving that design into being something better. Multiple studies, and this is in terms of graphic design, it would be multiple studies in color, composition, typography, i.e. you're changing colors, you're changing composition, you're changing the fonts, you're developing different treatments for the illustrations and the photographies, uh, the photographs, sorry, you're varying the sequence of how things are appearing, you're shuffling all of that and trying it again, and you're shuffling all of that and trying it again, you're shuffling all of that and trying it again, and then you go to sleep, and then you shuffle it all and try it again. And then you wake up dreaming about it, and you have a new idea, and then you shuffle it and you do it again. And then you get up in the morning and you take a shower and you shuffle all those ideas again. You get the idea? Iterative. Over and over and over and over. That's what makes it good. And then ultimately introducing new graphic shapes, lines, etc. Then we get down to this execution. This is where you're distilling down the best ideas from all that experimentation and design work that you just did. You're getting that final product. You're examining every detail. You're analyzing it objectively. You're reviewing the project brief to make sure you satisfy the requirements in the first place. And you're producing that final draft of the product. Now there's something in here that as I was going through this, I skipped over. And that is right here. Divorce from attachment. So I'm telling you right now, if you take nothing away from my class, like the whole semester you learned absolutely nothing, and you took this away, that would be enough. I would have succeeded. Okay? So this is absolutely critical that you understand, and it is the hardest thing as the designer that you will ever, ever do. And you probably already experienced this in one way or another. You as a designer, you get involved in your project, you get passionate about your project, you work hard on your project, you stay up all night and work on your project, and you think about your project, and you're obsessive about your project, and you produce this thing that you think is totally awesome. And then you go into a review, and the first thing the reviewer does is they take your model and they tear it apart. At that moment, you have two options. Anybody have this happen? A few, a few nodding heads. If it hasn't happened to you, it will happen to you. It's only a matter of time. At that moment, and it doesn't mean they physically tore your model apart. Uh, that, that does happen too. But it could mean that they tear it apart verbally. They go after you. They say, you didn't do it right. You, know, you, you left all these holes or whatever. You got attacked in the re review. So at that moment, when you're being attacked and you're being you know, pelted, you have two options. You can, you can curl up in a ball and cry and say, but my work is so precious to me and I care so much about it. And you can shut down and not listen to what they're saying. Or you can put your object out there and you can make yourself the reviewer and you can stand back and you can listen to what all those other people are saying and you look at your object as if it's not yours. It's weird. When you get away from being attached to your object, you can actually learn from all these people that are trying to give you help. People don't go into a review, the reviewers, saying, oh, I'm going to make somebody cry today. I can't wait. They go into a review saying, I really want to help these students become better designers. And the way that they're going to do that is they're going to point out the things you did wrong. And that's what what it's about. So if you shut down and you don't listen to what they have to say, and you become so attached to your object that you can't listen to what they have to say, you're not going to learn anything. You're not going to be a better designer. You have to find a way to step back from your object, step back from what it is that you were doing, and listen to what they're talking about. Listen to their criticism. And when you do that, you will learn and you will become a better designer. Some of the best things come out of a review and some of the best reviews happen when you're able to not think of this as your precious little baby because you'll learn so, so much more. So please try. It's really hard. It's really hard. But you will learn so much more because of it. So please think back on me. The next time that you're just being reamed at a uh, review, Think of this and try to open your eyes and be open to it. All right. Intuition. So I told you we talk first about inspiration and we get to intuition. 
This is trusting your inner voice. So intuition, no matter how much you learn the fundamentals, you can't become the best designer. If this was, if this was, if it was set up this way, let me use, let me use the world of photography as an example. Okay, I taught you guys the rule of thirds, right? So you're like, okay, great, I've got this rule of thirds. Could I teach a computer to use the rule of thirds? Yeah, recognize the subject, put it on one third, sure, sure good. But the computer wouldn't necessarily know which way somebody was facing in that rule of thirds. So they could have something satisfy the rule of thirds and have the person facing the wrong way. If we could do that, if we could have, teach a computer to do it, there would be no need for us as designers. The good news is we can't, so there's use for us, right? Good comprehension of techniques does not equal good design. So no matter how much you know the techniques, no matter how much you know the rule of thirds, there is still a part of it that requires you to know what is right and what is wrong. So you need to learn all the fundamentals and then trust your intuition. We'll talk about what that means. So intuition is a different level of thinking. It's the opposite of the rational thought. So the logic out thought process that gets you somewhere, intuition is that other side. It's the balance for it. It's the piece that's saying, eh, I don't know about that. It's that little voice in the back of your head saying, well, maybe you shouldn't do that. It comes naturally. It can't be forced. And it allows for things that aren't necessarily apparent, that, that wouldn't come from the rational thought process. Like I said, it's the complement. It's the balance. And so we need to cultivate that um, in, intuitive, intuitive uh, ability. So intuitive functions, guidance, protection, inspiration. Here comes that inspiration again, and enlightenment. The benefits of intuition are that it cultivates your imagination. It allows for designers to move beyond their comfort zone. If we as designers never moved outside of that comfort zone, if we got really comfortable like, oh, this is what I like to design, number one, as a designer, it's very unfulfilling. If you do the same thing over and over and over again, you get tired of doing the same thing over and over again. If you move outside of that, this is that balance that says, yeah, take the leap, but it's okay, I got your back. I'm not going to make you screw up too bad. Often it leads to fresh and innovative solutions. It increases the numbers of ideas that you generate, and it provides that spark to push the design forward. And that's a big one. So when you're not really thinking about it and whatever, all of a sudden something pops into your head and you say, I know where to go. I know how to move forward. Right? That's that opposite of rational thought. Challenges of intuition. You must allow this intuition to surface without worrying about the final outcome. It's the, it's the silly ideas that are in the back of your head. It takes time to believe that these instincts are valuable. Don't prejudge or abandon without allowing the maturation of the ideas in the first place. And it's not always useful. Sometimes it's just kind of one of those out there ideas. So how do you nurture this intuition? Number one, don't be afraid to take risks. And this is a big one. Now, I'm up here telling you don't be afraid to take risks. This is a little hard. And I know it's hard. You're a student, and you've got this thing called a grade at the end of the semester that you all stress about, right? I get it. The fun thing is when you finally get to grad school at the very end, like I got a grade on my thesis. Did I really care what grade I got? No. It wasn't about the grade anymore. Nobody's going to ask, hey, can I see your transcripts? Can I see the grade that you got on your thesis? Nope. Can't see that. Too bad. You know, do I have an M mark after my name? Yep. That's all that matters. But you guys, grades do matter because obviously they help you move on. So you need to have a little bit of an understanding of who your instructor is or who your professor is and how much leniency do they have for risk taking. And I'm telling you this as a caveat. So for me, in this class, you will never, ever be punished for taking a risk. I think that's part of the design process, and you should take the risks. Remember, I have all those built-in things about the regrades and whatever. right? If you take a risk and it flops, which it does sometimes, regrade, no problem, get your grade back up, no worries. So in my class, don't be afraid to take risks. 
Other classes, you have to evaluate and see. If I were teaching a studio, I taught 220 one time. It was fun. If I were teaching that studio, I would reward the people that took risks. I would be far more lenient on their grades than I would be on the conservative people. Because taking risks is part of the design process. Putting yourself out there and jumping is a big deal. So don't be afraid to do that. Listen to that inner voice and react to it. You know, you're starting to lean. Is it, is it pulling you back? Or is it like, no, this is a good idea. Keep going. Think about that. Expect the unexpected. Don't overanalyze. As soon as you start to overanalyze your intuition, it becomes rational thought, so it's not intuition anymore. So it just has to kind of float there. And you guys have seen this, OK? You guys have been in review. How many people have been in a review before? I'm guessing most of you have, OK? So the reviewers are sitting there in the review. And you've, you've probably seen it on their face. They're like, There's just, it's not, not quite there. Right? You've seen that? They're struggling to figure out what's wrong, but that's their intuition. They're saying, it's not quite right. I can tell. My gut is that it's just not, not quite right. And I'm trying to figure out. Now, as a reviewer, it's your job to figure out how to articulate that so you can explain it to somebody why it's eh, not quite right. Other times, you'll be in a review, and people will start getting really excited. I mean, you, you may not have had this one yet, but this is a really fun review. When people get excited, and then they start to get ahead of themselves, and they start coming up with things that you didn't think of that are really good, because you trust your intuition, and it ended up being a good idea. You just didn't know it yet. That can happen, too. So it's the opposite of the, eh, I don't know. It's the, oh, you, and you probably did this, and you did this, and, you, and they get really excited. That's a fun review to have. So it works on both ends really nicely. Record your thoughts and collect your visuals. Elevate your design. So I think this is a really good summary. And I'm going to end, uh, and then we'll move into album covers in just a second. But I'm going to end this by reading this quote, because I think it's really, really good. In the design process, there are things that you think about rationally, those that you learn about, those that you're looking for. And then there's this most interesting part that you cannot be rational about. You just feel it for some strange reason. If you feel it right, it will fit into the concept perfectly and make everything more interesting and unique. That's that intuition. That's that part of a designer that is like, yeah, I get it. It just feels right. So let's look at some album covers. Uh, I'm going to introduce InDesign today. We'll go through the application. I'll talk about some of the basic stuff that's going on. And then you're going to be creating an album cover for an artist of your choice which is always really fun to see what people pick. So in the interest of album covers, I figured I'd throw some album covers up there. I tried hard to cover as many different genres as I could so that hopefully at least you'll recognize one of the albums up here. Um, but album covers are a really unique thing. And they used to be a big deal when you had like an actual record. And the album cover was a big part of that. Now it's become like artwork on your computer screen, like you know, on your phone or whatever what's playing. But it's still a, it's a way of selling. You know, Brooke, you talked about right in the beginning. It's a way of selling something. That's what this graphic design is. This is a way of selling the music. And so you're trying to figure out how to sell the music. And when you start to think about this stuff, it's kind of entertaining when you look at album covers. Which album covers make you want to listen to them? I'm not sure that makes me want to listen to them. But I had to do it because it's ridiculous. They're just, they're unique. And there's new ones every day that come out. And so I'm just going to start flipping through them so that you get a, a good sense. This is, I think, one of the best album covers of all time. It's just a fantastic album cover. You know, sometimes there's, there's artists that do, do two different versions of an album. That's why I included this one on here, where they have the acoustic version and the non-acoustic version of the album, which is kind of interesting to see how the two albums correlate to each other. That's done in the world before Photoshop. I went through a series of all the black and whites.
There's no reason that you guys couldn't do this one today. This is not very complicated. I had to throw this in for my wife. She would have, she would have been mad at me if there wasn't a Madonna album in there. So I told you I'd come back to, to music that has inspired me along the way. So um, I have a very broad taste in music, let's put it that way. I, I listened to the Pirates of the Caribbean to write my thesis. This was my album of choice for modeling. So I would sit down and build physical models and I would listen to this um, really loud in my headphones. It was great. Um, this was a one-time concert that was done, uh, collaboration between uh, Metallica and the San Francisco Symphony. And it's wild. But I happen to like Metallica, and with the symphony behind him, it was pretty cool. So this whole concept of an album was a really fun one for me uh, because I really liked it, and it helped me model. I would sit there for like 16 hours straight building models, and then after 16 hours, realize I had to pee. I, I better go to the bathroom. Uh, that's what happens. You get obsessive in this. Um, but anyway. Very iconic album. I, I had to throw this one in there. This is so 90s, right? Um, as a side note, I told you I have a very broad taste in music. So um, it was one of my life goals to see him in concert. And uh, I saw him two years ago in Sacramento. It was when he first came back uh, on tour after 20 years off. Hands down, the best concert I have ever been to. He was that good in concert. And you look at this and you're like, no way. No way he was that good. He really was. He really was that good. Um, so, for whatever it's worth. So I'm almost done. I had to throw this one in there, too. OK, so we're going to switch over for a second. Give me a second to switch the uh, computer over. I'll go through InDesign. Why don't we take a 10-minute break or so. I'll start back at 9.05. And then I'll walk you through InDesign. You'll create your album cover uh, for today. OK, so we're going to start up again. Um, in the world of InDesign. I'm going to walk through InDesign first, uh, and then we'll actually create an album cover together, and then you guys will be free to work on your album cover. <coughs> Remember what I said about it doesn't mean that you can't use techniques in Photoshop. So if you want to spend some time in Photoshop touching up, making things transparent, that's what Photoshop's for, and then you bring it into InDesign. So I'm going to go ahead and open up InDesign to start. We've been opening Photoshop. Next to it is InDesign. So we'll let that open up here. There we go. And so when it first comes up, we need to create something new. So I'll go ahead and click on the Create New button here. And when this comes up, we have a variety of options. Our, um, there's probably a, a letter size as your recent. Uh, if we come over, we have something called Print. And under this tab, we have a variety of different sizes one of which is compact disc. That's the size we're going to use today. Um, but there are also web sizes, depending on what you wanted to create. There's mobile sizes, et cetera. So these are set up for certain size working uh, zones. Most of what you're going to be doing is probably letter or tabloid, which would be uh, 11 by 17. Today, we're going to come down here and click on the compact disc size right there. Um, over here, under the preset details, the units for this compact disc, 28P4.157 probably doesn't mean much to you guys. Uh, in true graphic terms, uh, this is a unit called a pica, which is a graphic design layout unit. If you were working for a magazine, for example, using InDesign, they would work in picas. That means absolutely nothing to me. And I have no idea what the translation is. So for me personally, I like to change the units into inches so that I can see what the sizes are. Now, obviously, compact disk size is a little weird. It doesn't, doesn't matter for our purposes today. But I just want you to be aware that you can change the units here. I'll show you how to change them after the fact, too. Um, but I'm going to switch those into inches. This is a square document. But if we had a letter size document, for example, we could switch from portrait to landscape here. There is also a checkbox for something called a facing page. We'll get to this when we get to the portfolios later in this section. 
facing pages are like a book. When you have two pages and you open those two pages and they both have stuff on them, that's a facing page. And so you could set up that kind of a layout in InDesign, which is great for a book type document. For our purposes today, it's just one page, so it doesn't make any difference whether you check it or uncheck it. We'll come down here. The rest of these options are all fine. I will talk about bleed and slug later on in the, the, the semester, so we'll have an understanding of what that is. For today, it doesn't matter. And I'll go ahead and click on Create. So that then creates my um, document that I'm going to work on. Uh, there's this little blue ribbon that probably shows up at the bottom of the page. And do you want to use Photoshop shortcuts or Illustrator shortcuts? If you get really into using shortcuts, you, you can customize this depending on which one you want. Um, I usually click on Illustrator because InDesign is closer to Illustrator in my world, but that's a personal preference. And I tend not to use shortcuts when I'm in front of you guys anyway because I don't want you to not know what I'm pressing as I work. So let's talk about the InDesign interface a little bit. It is an Adobe product, so it seems and looks kind of similar to Photoshop, which is the way it should be. Um, we have our typical file menu structure across the top, which looks very similar to Photoshop. Below that is a contextual ribbon that will change based on what command is selected. We have our standard tools running down the left side. Those tools are slightly different than Photoshop. Couple tools of note, there are two different selection tools in InDesign and also in Illustrator, for what it's worth. There is something called a direct selection tool and a regular selection tool. For our purposes today, you will be working with the black arrow or the regular selection tool. I'll explain the direct selection a little bit later on. Uh, there is a text tool that has <coughs> a T on it. As you come down a little bit further, there's a rectangle with an X through it. And that is called the frame tool or the rectangular frame tool. We're going to use that a little bit later today. Um, I'll come back, but there's a free transform tool, also another one that's important. And then I'm going to come down to where the colors are. And in Photoshop, we had a foreground color and a background color. InDesign and Illustrator work a little bit differently. We have a fill color and what's called a stroke color. The stroke color is essentially an outline. <coughs> Obviously, my voice is starting to go. Sorry about that. Um, so if I were to create something right now, it would have no fill color, no field color, but it would have an outline that is black. So just something to be aware of. Okay. We have our document that's in this page. <coughs> Pressing Control-0 will fill the page with our document, which it did by default. Our rulers are a little bit interesting in that they start at this upper left corner and they go positive in one direction and negative in the other direction. And if I were to move the page, the rulers move too. <coughs> so the rulers are attached to the document, not attached to the, the workspace. So 0, 0 is that upper corner right there. On the right side here, we have some other little windows that will open. We'll spend more time working with these later on in the class. There's a window for pages that can open. We're only working with one page today, so it doesn't matter. There are layers, much like in the world of Photoshop. The big difference between layers in InDesign and Illustrator versus layers in Photoshop <coughs> sorry, is that you can have more than one object on a layer in InDesign. And in Photoshop, you can only have one object on a layer. So it's a little bit different. Uh, well, we'll I'll get to links in just a second. Stroke is the outline, contains information about the outline, color is about color, etc. Links. So this is another big thing for you guys to understand about InDesign. So InDesign is fundamentally a referenced system. So when we bring something into InDesign, we're not copying something in and it's permanently in our InDesign file. InDesign works by referencing other files. So whether it's a text file, like a Word document, whether it's a photograph, whether it's, I don't know what else it would be, uh, some kind of graphic or whatever, all of those are referenced objects. We say, take this object and put it here. And InDesign says, great, I'll do that when I do an export. Otherwise, I'm going to show you a little preview of what that might look like. But when I go to do the export, I need to know where the original file is. So your file organization at this point in the semester becomes critical. So 
if you download something, a photograph for example, and put it on the desktop, and you forget to save that photograph onto your flash drive, and the computer restarts, and you come back on Wednesday, and you open up your album cover again, and you don't have that photograph, it won't be able to do the export with the photograph in it. So you have to save the original files and the InDesign files. You can think of the InDesign files as just kind of like an organization scheme. This is how I want to put the stuff on the page. All the stuff exists over here. And so that's available in this links menu. And we'll see that once I bring something in. Uh, this Creative Commons libraries thing, uh, we can minimize over to the side. It's not doing much for us right now. OK, so as I look at my page, the white space here is the actual page. That's what I'm working with. The gray space is off the page. So if an object falls off the page, when I do the export, it's going to get cut off because all we see is the, the document itself. There are also these purple and pink lines that are set a half an inch in on my document. These are what InDesign calls margins. Um, they mean absolutely nothing. They're completely arbitrary. So we can ignore them or we can actually change them. If I go up to the um, file menu and I go to document setup, never mind, it's not there. It's under layout, margins, and columns. My bad. Um, if I go to layout and margins and columns here, I could set the margins to be at zero, which essentially would mean that it's going to be a full bleed. There is a little chain that locks all of them at the same value. So if I change one, for example, they'll all change. So I only have to change 1 to 0, and they'll all change to 0. And that essentially puts the margins at the edge, so it's not distracting us anymore. So once again, that's under Layout, Margins and Columns, and I set the margins to 0. And I'll say OK. The other thing that I told you, I would tell you, if you happen to not change the units until you created the document, it's not a problem. If you come to where the two rulers meet and you right click, you can change the units really quickly there into any of the other units that you want. OK, so now it's time to start creating uh, the album cover in the first place. And so um, if we were going to create an album cover, we would need some album artwork in the first place. Uh, so likewise, I would pick a Creative Commons search or maybe the Unsplash website, again, thanks to Nick. Um, as a background image for what it is that I was trying to do. Obviously, I'd have to pick my artist first. That would be important. Um, and for the fun of it, I'll do Garth Brooks. Why not? Uh, and so then I need some kind of a background image for his new album. And so since it's going to be a country album, maybe it needs to be some kind of grass field or farm or something like that. And so I would find some kind of enjoyable image. And so we'd scroll through here a little bit. I don't think the elephant's the right move. You know, maybe it's something like that. And I'll go ahead and download that image. There it is. Let's show it in its folder. And like I said, I'm not going to leave this file on the computer, I'm going to make sure that I copy that over into today's folder. So I'm going to right click and say copy. I'll move to my OneDrive into today's folder. Let me do a new folder for this semester, spring of 2019. Uh, how about 2019, not 2109? Not that old yet. And then we'll go ahead and click uh, Paste here. I'll right click and paste, and there it is. So then I need to bring that image that I just found into this document. And I'm going to do that using the Rectangular Frame tool. So over here on the left side, there's a rectangle with an X in it. And essentially what that is, is it's giving me a place to put an image. So if I drag a box there, this is going to act like a placeholder for an image until I put an image into it. And so it exists, if I use the black uh, selection tool here, it exists as this uh, rectangle with an X on it. If I select that rectangle and then go up to the File menu and choose Place, right there, 
And when I do that, I'm going to go find that original photograph. So I'll go into my live demonstrations folder here. And I'll go into today's folder. There it is. There's my image. And I'll go ahead and click on Open. And when I do that, it drops the image into the frame that I created. So the image is bigger than the frame by a lot. And so now that I'm here, I have some options in terms of seeing it. So the first thing is if I right click, I can go to something called fitting. And this is something that I would encourage you to get very familiar with. We have a couple different options, and I'm going to walk through all of those. Fill frame proportionally means it's going to fill the entire frame that I have with the image, but it's going to cut off parts of the image. So the whole frame will be full, but if the image is not the same aspect ratio as my frame, some of the image is going to hang off either side. So let me go ahead and fill frame proportionally, and there it is. Looks pretty good. If I were to, I'm going to click on the direct select here just so you can see it, this orange border is the whole image underneath my frame. So technically, I have an image that goes all the way from there over to there. But because my frame is a different aspect ratio, I'm only seeing this part of the image. Another option, I'm going to back up here for a second. Right click, fitting, fit content proportionally. This is going to fit the entire image inside of the frame, even if there is blank space at the top and the bottom. So I'll get the whole image inside the frame, but I end up with these blank pieces on either side. So it's a little bit different. If I right click and go to fitting, I can fit frame to content. That's going to make the frame bigger. So if I do that, we'll get the whole image. If I right click and go to fitting, fit content to frame, it's going to fit everything inside of the image, which doesn't look too bad, but if we look closely, it essentially squished the image to fit inside. A couple more options here in fitting. We have centering the content, and we can clear the frame fitting options if we wanted to. So I'm going to go ahead and fill the frame proportionally, this first option here. There it is. Now what if I really wanted the frame to be a little bit bigger? Well, I can take the frame, and I can make the frame bigger. And I'm seeing more of the image here, but I'm losing the image here. Let me go ahead and drag each end of this to be the whole size of my album cover there. And I'll go back to right click, and I'll go to fitting, and I'll go to fill frame proportionally. So I can keep doing it as many times as I want to. If I double click on the image, I'll get into the uh, selection of the image behind the frame in which case I can move the image and get the composition right for my album cover. Maybe something like that. So this image right, is now placed into this scene. It's a reasonable quality version of this image. Sometimes you'll place an image and it'll look blurry. And I get this question a lot. Well, wait a minute, why is the image blurry? When that happens, InDesign is giving us a preview of the image, not a full resolution version of the image. And so to get the full resolution version, we'll right click on the image, we'll go to display performance, and we've got fast display, typical display, and high quality display. The high quality display will give us a full resolution version of the image so we can see it in all its glory. The fast display will give us a X, a gray rectangle. So imagine for a second that you had 150 page document that was full of images. That would be a heavy document. There's a lot of content there. And you wanted to be able to flip through and check the text. And you didn't want to concentrate on the images. You could switch your display performance to this fast quality display because you didn't need to see all the images. Alternatively, if you wanted to see the high resolution version of all the images, you could switch over to the high quality display. And that would give us the highest quality version of the images in preview. So right here, we can come over to my uh, windows here, and I can click on links. Remember, we had links open before. And when I click on links, you can actually see that I have a link directly to that file. That's where it's going to get the full information. So if I edited this file, it would update in InDesign. So let's try that for a second. I'm going to go ahead and go find that file. Let 
Let me make sure I get the actual one here. Okay, let's take this one. I'm going to right click and say open with. Oh, really? You're not going to include Photoshop there? Sometimes. So let's say I took this photo here. I said, you know what? I really wanted this to be in black and white. I'd go in and I'd go into my uh, layer, new adjustment layer. I go to my channel mixer. Say, OK. We're going to convert this to monochrome. I go through my various options. Yeah, OK, that's the way I want it to look. Um, where's my preset here? I'm trying to lighten up the sky there a little bit. OK, that's great. I'm going to go to File, Save As. I'm going to put it in the same place, and I'm going to save it as a JPEG, so it's the same, same file type, same name. I'll go ahead and click on Save. Yes, replace it. Yep, all that's good. So this is black and white now. If I go back to InDesign, we can look here in the links, and there's a little triangle. It says something's changed. Do I want to update it? Double click to update. If I double click, guess what? It converts to black and white. So it's tied to that file. So if I make changes to that file, it will automatically update in my InDesign file. So now that I have that established, it's time to bring in some more content. So like I said, this was going to be a Garth Brooks album. So in the world of Garth Brooks, uh, he has a little logo. So I should probably go find a Garth Brooks logo. So I'm just going to do an image search because it's co probably copywritten here. So here's a, here's a nice Garth Brooks logo. I can go ahead and visit that. And I could download it. There it is. So let me go ahead and show it again. And I'm going to copy that and put it into today's folder. So notice that every time I'm taking the effort of copying the file and making sure it's organized so that I don't lose it. So I would then paste this right there. So I'd come back to InDesign, and I'd say, OK, let me create another frame. So let me come to the Frame tool here. I'll go here. I want to place that image in. I'll go to File, and then Place. And I'll say, OK, I want to drop this in. There it is. I'll right click, and I'll say Fitting. And let's fill frame proportionally. Uh, let's fit, fit content proportionally so I get the whole thing. Uh, and then I could come back to my Direct Select, and I could move this over and kind of crop it down a little bit. OK, so that's nice. But the problem is that I'm getting the, the solid white background, and I really don't want that. So here's another opportunity to change this in Photoshop. So the first thing that I do is I go into Photoshop. Let's open up that file. There it is. I'll open it. And so I could just invert the image. So black and white change. So let me try that. I'll go to Image, uh, Adjustments, and then Invert. It's also Control-I. That gives us a white on black, which would be fine. Now, could I delete the black? Sure. I can go into a color selection. I'm going to show you two ways of doing this. I'm going to select Color Range. I'm going to pick the black. Uh, let me right click and say Layer from Background so that when I press the Delete key, it goes away. That leaves me with just the white. And then I could do a save. So I could go to File, Save As. In this case, I'd have to save it as a PNG file to preserve the transparency. So I'll make sure I choose PNG uh, and then save. So in this scenario, the background would stay transparent. The alternative, though, would be once I've inverted the file here, I could do a just a file save. So this is a JPEG. There we go. Yes, I want to replace it. Perfect. 
All right. So again, the little triangle shows up. Do I want to update it? Yes, I want to update it. Double click. There it is. So that's just the black version. So with the PNG, I could go to File and then Place. I could drop the PNG in. I'll right click and say Fitting, um, Fill Frame Proportionally. There it is. And it would have a transparent background. Right, same thing. Alternatively, though, remember we did blending modes in Photoshop. Well, guess what? Blending modes exist in InDesign as well. So with that selected, let me go ahead and view my transparency. I'm going to go to Window, and then hold on a second. Where is it? You gotta love it when I can't find what I'm looking for. I don't think it's under color. Sorry, it's under effects. There we go. Uh, so it's under effects. So I went to window and then effects right there to show that. And then with the effects window open here, there's my blending mode. So just like in Photoshop, I can switch from normal. Instead of being in multiply, we're going to go to the next likely option, which would be screen. And it's going to be showing through the white or showing through the black in that scenario. So I'm getting just that. Looks like it's still showing a little bit, which means that this probably wasn't purely black. I'm just showing you that that exists as an option. So in this scenario, this was probably the better option to make the PNG, but uh, I wanted to at least point that out. So let me go ahead and get rid of that frame, and we'll stick with this one. Go ahead and move this over there. Now, if I wanted this logo to get a little bit bigger, I can't just grab the sides and make the frame bigger, because it's not going to change the content underneath. Instead, I have to come to this tool which is like a rectangle with a bunch of dots on it and a little uh, cursor. That's the free transform tool. When I have that tool selected, I can actually make the object bigger. I'm going to hold down Shift to keep it in proportion, and I can make the object bigger. So I have that established. Now let's say that um, Garth decided he was going to need uh, parental guidance on this album. Uh, we would need to go find that. So I go back into my uh, search here. And we do a uh, parental advisory logo. There we go. And so I could pick any one of these. It would be fine. Um, let me right click and say, Save Image As. And again, I'm going to put it on my flash drive in today's folder. That is not today's folder. And we'll go ahead and drop that one in. Perfect. And now I can bring that in as well. So again, I'll start with the frame. I'll go to File and then Place. I'll choose the Parental Advisory and say Open. There it is. It's too big. So I'll right click and say Fitting. We're going to fill frame proportionally like that. Actually, I was pretty close to what the aspect ratio was. Uh, let me go to Fitting. Uh, fit frame to content. There we go. So I get the exact size. And then we can move this over. Sorry. Oh, come on. Sorry. I was doing the Mac shortcuts instead of the Windows shortcuts. There we go. Stop. No. There we go. And I could move this over. If I wanted the size to be a little bit smaller, I could use my uh, free transform tool. We could shrink that down. I'm holding down Shift to keep that in proportion. And there we go. I can create that. So you guys are free to pick whatever uh, artist you want, whatever album you want. 
Uh, it usually takes a little bit of Photoshop work, a little bit of InDesign work. If you wanted to actually put your own text in, so let's say the album uh, name, you would go up to the text tool, the type tool, and you're going to create a text box that your text is going to go in. There it is. We'll spend a whole lecture talking about type. Um, we'll call it the fence. Um, right now it's black text, so I need to come up here and I need to change a few things. One, the size needs to get a little bit bigger. Make it a little bit bigger than that. Two, the color needs to change. So right now it's black. And we look here on our um, fill color is black. If I want to change that, I'll double click on it, change the color to white. That essentially means I need to go to the upper corner and then all the way up to this value here. And that then creates the text here. If I don't like the font, I can select it and then choose from the list of system fonts to be a different font. In that case, it made it a little bit too big, so we'll shrink it down like that. Okay. So your job today is to just experiment with this, create the album cover. When you're done creating it, you're going to do two things. One, you're going to save the InDesign file, which is the INDD file. So I'll go to File and then Save. And this then creates the InDesign file. I'll go to my folder for today. Oops. And I'll click Save. This would allow me to open it back up. There are some times where InDesign gets really cranky about talking to other versions of InDesign. The hope is that the version that's on these computers is close enough to the one that's on your home computer, if you have it, uh, to talk nicely. If you have CS6, the Creative Cloud version does not talk to CS6. They get really cranky with each other. So just be aware that sometimes you can have issues uh, with file types. So I've saved the InDesign file. This would allow us to open the layout again. Um, once I'm done there, I'm going to go to File and then Export. This is going to create the JPEG version. Typically, coming out of InDesign, we would be creating lots of um, PDFs because that's a typical output. In our purposes, we're going to create a JPEG for today. So I'm going to change the Save As type from Adobe PDF down to JPEG. Uh, and once I've done that, I'll go ahead and click on Save. It brings up the Export JPEG options here. Uh, it is important that we change the quality up to maximum and the resolution to be at 300 instead of 72. If you leave it at 72, it will be too small. So we'll go up to 300 and the rest of the options are just fine and I'll go ahead and click on export. And that will then build the JPEG file of this. If you wanted to see a preview without the little uh, boxes that are containing the objects, you can go up to the View menu and choose Screen Mode Preview instead of Screen Mode Normal. And that will take all the boxes away and let us look at it as if it were a final product. Sometimes people find that useful to, to double check. So once again, that was under the View menu. And that was under Screen Mode. And I switched from Normal to Preview. So we'll go back to Normal. And we can see the boxes and the margins and, and that sort of thing. OK, so I'm going to let you guys work. Um, and kind of get, get your feet wet with this. We will continue with InDesign next class. So there'll be lots more of InDesign work. Um, and I'll talk you through that at that point.